Maybe he has said some stupid things, like that CTE doesn't exist, the military is so great because so many of the members grew up playing football, or the fact that his team got into a fight and he said a fight didn't happen, but Larry Fedora is one of the more underappreciated and forgotten coaches in the recent memory of college football. He was the best coach in Southern Miss football history and was seen as one of the brightest young minds in the game at one point. He was a pretty good coach in North Carolina, but obviously things haven't really worked out fully for Fedora in the end, and as of 2021, he needs to find a new job, and some may be asking if his time in the Power 5 is almost over. Today we're going to continue our series looking at the rise and fall of coaches, and talk about the rise of Larry Fedora, his time at North Carolina, and why he ultimately could not last. But first, be sure to subscribe if you love college football, like if you want to support the channel, let me know another coach I should take a look at next, and turn on post notifications so you never miss another upload of mine. Now let's get started and talk about the rise and fall of Larry Fedora. I've been having hood dreams. Like we always do, let's go back in time and talk about how Larry Fedora became a big time coach to begin with. He was born in College Station, Texas, so from a young age he was surrounded by the game of football due to Texas A&M being located there. He was a football star in high school and went on to become a wide receiver for Austin College where he developed a love for coaching the game of football. He immediately joined the staff at Austin College as a graduate assistant and then he went over to Garland High School in Texas where he made a name for himself. They were one of the more powerhouse programs in the state and he used that as leverage to get multiple jobs at Baylor. He coached the wide receivers, tight ends, and running backs throughout his time at Baylor, and after that, he took the offensive coordinator job with Air Force, and he was starting to rise through the coaching ranks. He used that as a springboard to get the offensive coordinator job at Middle Tennessee, before he took his first Power 5 job with Ron Zook at Florida. This is where he started to become a big-time name, and developed his reputation as an offensive guy. He went back to the Big 12, and became the offensive coordinator for Mike Gundy at Oklahoma State, and he became known for his spread-style offense, and became one of the hottest coaching names in the country. Apparently, he was offered head coaching jobs by Rice and Air Force, and both LSU and Alabama wanted him as an assistant on their staff. In 2007, the Baylor job was rumored to come down to him and Art Bryles, and as we all know, it went to Bryles in the end. He was hired by Southern Miss to be the 18th head coach in school history, and their athletic director had this to say, quote, This is a great day. I've talked at length with Coach Fedora, and I feel like he has the best interest of the student-athlete at heart. I believe he can take us to the next level of excellence. It has been a collaborative, successful search process, and I can't wait to be at The Rock in 2008. It was a pretty big day for the school, and Fedora would go on to become the best coach in school history in my opinion. In his first year, the Eagles went 7-6 and six and made a bowl game. In year 2, they also went 7-6 and six once again and made a bowl as well. In year 3, they went 8-5 and five and he was slowly building a program and they got better every year. Year 4 was when he broke out onto the national coaching scene as the Eagles went 12-2 and two, and they were ranked as high as number 19 in the coaches poll. They even upset Kevin Sumlin's Houston Cougars at the time and Fedora was now a big time coaching candidate for multiple reasons. First, he was seen as a quarterback developer as he helped Chris Leak at Florida, Zach Robinson at Oklahoma State, and Austin Davis at Southern Miss. His teams also always got better with time, and he showed he could build upon prior years. Recruiting was always something he was good at as well, as he landed a 5-star recruit in his time at Southern Miss by the name of DeAndre Brown. He was a 5-star blue chip wide receiver and chose to play for Southern Miss over offers from all around the country, and he's even a top 300 recruit of all time in the recruiting era. That says a lot about Fedora and the vision he could sell to his players. His offense was great in his last year, as they were basically top 20 in every offensive category. Finally, he had a ton of experience, as he basically coached every position group on the offensive side, was a head coach, and coached in both the Big 12 and the SEC as a coordinator, so he pretty much knew what he was doing. Because of this, he was seen as a coach who could take head coaching jobs at Arizona, Texas A&M, UCLA, Boston College, or even Ole Miss, but in the end, none of those would happen. After Butch Davis was let go by North Carolina, the Tar Heels hired Fedora to become their next head coach of the program, and there were a lot of high hopes for Tar Heel football. He came in with some sanctions and the inability to play in postseason play due to what Butch Davis had done, so it was going to be a tough job. Despite that, he led the Heels to their first winning record in the ACC since 2004, and they finished first in their division. They had Bryn Renner at quarterback, Giovanni Bernard as the running back, and a young Eric Ebron as the playmaker at tight end. It was disappointing that they couldn't play in a bowl game, but the future looked really bright in Chapel Hill. Fedora brought in the 28th best class in the country, and he was infusing talent into the program. Renner was the starter for a bit, but backup quarterback Marquise Williams started to show his talent and eventually became the guy for the future. Williams was also the best runner on the team, and Eric Ebron and Quinn Chad Davis were the stars in the receiving game. 
They started out 1-5, but they turned it around in the second half of the season and won their next five games to get the six wins and bowl eligibility. They did lose to their rival Duke, though, and they beat Cincinnati in the Belk Bowl. Going into 2014, Williams was still the starting quarterback, but they had a player by the name of Mitchell Trubisky who was going to be the backup quarterback, and he was the future after him. Plus, they had signed borderline five-star recruit Elijah Hood the year prior, and he soon become the team's best running back. They began the season ranked number 23 in the country, but after a loss to East Carolina, they dropped three more games and the season started to spiral out of control. They did win four of their next five games, including a win over number 25 Duke, and they would get back to six wins. The season would end on a sour note though, as they lost their last regular season game and just blew it to Rutgers in the Quick Lane Bowl. They lost to most of the good teams on their schedule, and some were worried about the future of the program and if he would take the next step. In 2015, the Tar Heels had Marquise Williams back for his senior year, Elijah Hood broke out into one of the best backs in college football, and they had four receivers in Matt Collins, Quinshed Davis, Bug Howard, and Ryan Switzer. They lost to South Carolina in a thriller in a Week 1 game, but they would go on a tear after that. They won their next seven games and got back into the AP poll at number 21, and they were alive in the race for the ACC championship game. They put up 66 points against Duke, 59 against Miami, and beat Virginia Tech in overtime, and they were one win away from the ACC championship game. They took care of NC State and were now ranked number 8 for their matchup with number 1 Clemson. Many thought North Carolina had no shot, but they were right in the game and they were only down 7 with a minute to go. The Tar Heels even recovered an onside kick, but apparently a ref thought a North Carolina player was offsides, threw the flag, and they would have to re-kick it. Looking at the replay, people were shocked as there was not a player offsides and the commentators were furious about this. But the play wasn't reviewable, they would re-kick it, they wouldn't get it, and North Carolina would lose the game, and it was unfair. Had they have won that game, Clemson would not have gotten in, and North Carolina would have likely taken that fourth spot. They would have gotten into the college football playoff, and Fedora would be known a lot differently had that offsides penalty not happened. We will never know what would have happened on that final drive, but I assume Fedora would have gone for two. They would be matched up with Baylor in the Russell Athletic Bowl, and they could get some revenge in that, but they lost the game, and it was a disappointing end of the season, and now many thought that offsides call really didn't matter. Going into 2016, they were matched up with Georgia for the Chick-fil-A kickoff game, and both teams were ranked, but they would lose a close one. They would beat number 12 Florida State and would enter the polls again, but then lost to Virginia Tech, and they fell out completely. They bounced back with a win over Miami, though, and this sent them back into the polls, but they would exit for good after a loss to Duke, and that Duke team was the worst Duke team in seven years, and this is the game where it was kind of a turning point. They got matched up in the Sun Bowl with Stanford and lost the game and the Tar Heels went 8-5. Trubisky had a really good year and left for the NFL. Elijah Hood would fall off as well, but he would leave for the NFL. And Ryan Switzer emerged as one of the best wide receivers in the country. 2017 was going to be a big year for Fedora and expectations rose, but he would have to find a new quarterback. Chaz Surratt would be the guy at first, and as we all know, he now is on the defensive side of the ball. Nathan Elliott would get some time as well, and they also brought in LSU transfer Brandon Harris to compete. Sadly, nothing went the team's way in 2017, and the quarterback play was not very good, as the whole season was just a disaster as they started at 1-8 and, and things looked really bad. They did beat Pittsburgh and Western Carolina, but they finished at 3-9 and, and it just wasn't a good season for the Tar Heels, and Fedora would need a bounce back season in 2018. Nathan Elliott was the quarterback for 2018, and they had four different running backs who could do damage. Sadly, this didn't help the Tar Heels as they lost their first two games to start the season once again, and after a thrilling win over Pitt, it all went downhill for good. They lost their next six games, and besides they went over Western Carolina once again, they didn't win a game for the remainder of the season and went 2-9 because of the UCF game was cancelled. This was a really bad look for Larry Fedora, and he had some things off the field that really made it tough to keep him around. He annoyed a lot of the fans, the administration, and just the media. He said CTE wasn't proven to be real. He talked about how the military was so strong because of the game of football, and in his last coach game, a brawl broke out against NC State. The defensive breakdowns and questionable play callings contributed to 7 losses in 2018 by a grand total of 46 points, and that's heartbreaking. He never took recruiting the state seriously and had a very questionable relationship with everyone in the community. A lot of people said he dug his own grave. They said he should have brought a shovel to the press conference after the NC State game because late in the game when NC State scored a game-winning touchdown, they were fist thrown. But in the press conference, Fedora said he did not see a fight, and that was the last draw. He ended up being fired, and he was replaced by Mac Brown, as we all know, and North Carolina football had a rebirth since Fedora left. Larry would still get a chance, though, as he joined the staff at Texas, but he only lasted one year as a Longhorn. Going into 2020, Dave Aranda brought him in to be at Baylor, but things went terribly for him, and he was fired after one season with the Bears. 
So we may be asking, what happened to Larry Fedora? Well, he was a good coach in my opinion, as he led UNC to two ACC titles and had them consistently making bowl games. His downfall was his tough two-year stretch and his off-the-field mouth. To be fair, so many of those losses were close, but that just made it more heartbreaking, and when it came time to see if he could get one more shot, the fans and the administration had enough of him and decided to move on and not give him another chance. I also wonder what would have happened if Mitchell Trubisky had stayed another year, but we will never know. North Carolina is not a blue blood, so I think Fedora could have spent more time in Chapel Hill, but this is a reminder to always be the best person you can be on and off the field, and avoid saying stupid things. I'm not sure if you will ever get another chance to be a head coach, yet alone a coordinator for a Power 5 program, but we will have to wait and see what happens. What do you guys think though? If you're a North Carolina fan, let me know why you think his tenure did not work out. And if you're just a college football fan in general, I would love to know your thoughts. Let me know another coach I should take a look at next as I love doing this series. And also be sure to give the video a like if you enjoyed the content and want to support college football on YouTube. Subscribe if you're new to the channel and have not already subscribed. And check out all my other videos about the rise and fall of coaches. I hope to see you guys again soon, but until next time, peace.